What I would like to do today is to give you an overview of the mental health issues that arise in the Indigenous context. One of the things that's interesting for Indigenous people, as you'll hear, uh, is at least in the North American context, in Australia, New Zealand, that the word culture has become a salient word for people. Whereas for most people in the world, if you talk about culture, they don't quite know what you mean, or they assume you mean going to the symphony orchestra or something. It's, you know, it's not uh, a common term that they're using to frame identity, except in areas where culture gets contested. And that's precisely what has happened in the case of indigenous people, where uh, there were deliberate efforts by colonizing powers to suppress people's culture. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that we're, we'll, we'll be looking at. Uh, I'll say a little bit about this on a global level, but I'll mostly be talking about the Canadian example because that's the one I know the best and it certainly serves to illustrate many of the points that could be applied uh, to other contexts. Uh, and um, we'll be focusing on the mental health aspects and we'll talk primarily about uh, issues of identity, issues of adaptation, and focus probably a fair bit on the problem of suicide because as you'll hear for some indigenous groups, there are very high rates of suicide, particularly among young males, and that poses an important question to understand, well, why, why them, and why at this point in time, and why has this problem actually gotten worse over, uh, um, uh, in recent years for the most part, uh, and can we come up with um, a better understanding of that that might lead to strategies for intervention, which is the kind of work that I've been involved with. Um, and then the flip side of that, because that's looking at a kind of vulnerability of individuals and of a whole population, of whole communities, the flip side of that is looking at the question of resilience. Uh, because it's a fact that even though we can make generalizations and say on average uh, certain indigenous groups are doing poorly in terms of mental health compared to the general population, there are communities and groups that are actually doing very well, even better than the general population. So, and and with, even within those communities where there are many, many young people uh, negatively affected, there are people who are doing well. So you have a question of resilience both at the individual level, why are some people doing well despite facing the same adversity as others, uh, and you have an issue of adversity at the uh, uh, community or uh, nation or population level, why do some whole groups do better, and do we have any clues uh, to that? that um, and these are all areas where, as it turns out, culture plays a significant role in, in various meanings of the term. So that's what we're going to try to cover today, uh, and we'll, we'll take a break part way through. Uh, so to begin with, <coughs> the term indigenous peoples, which has become a, a, an accepted uh, global international term, uh, has several different meanings packed into it. Um, part of it is a historical meaning, that these are pe groups of people, ethnic groups, communities, who identify themselves as the original people of a place. Um, that's a complicated historical issue because in many places people migrated, whether it was 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, migrated from some other place. So where you decide, okay, that's the moment at which you get to call yourself indigenous is a, you know, it's a complex historical negotiation or self-definition process. Um, but then what's happened for those people is that they, as I mentioned, were in many cases were then colonized. So people came from elsewhere, and it's that contrast of the settlers or the colonizers and the original people that really clarifies the meaning of the word indigenous in that context. So it's indigenous vis-a-vis -vis people who came from elsewhere uh, and who are, are now, um, uh, in many cases, have become dominant in the politics of the region. So you have both local people coming from outside and then an uneven distribution of power. And all of that becomes part of the picture of the situation of indigenous people. The fact that in many cases indigenous people have been in the same place for a very long time means that there are ways in which their culture uh, reflects that particular context. Um, because they've sort of, you know, developed in parallel with discovering various modes of subsistence and uh, materials that they can use and uh, a, a whole way of life that fits that particular uh, context. Um, so this notion of being connected to a particular place as part of your identity is in contrast to a more mobile sense of self. You could contrast then indigenous with cosmopolitan in a sense, that you have people who, well, I don't really belong anywhere, I could live anywhere. Uh, and in the contemporary world, maybe they're identified more with their profession or with some transnational network that you know, has 
uh, sort of tentacles going in all different places, and so they don't need to be rooted in one place, and they don't define themselves so much in terms of that place. And there are various peoples who, for various reasons, have had nomadic lifestyles, have not been allowed to connect themselves to place. You know, you think of the Roma, uh, people who came originally from uh, northern India, but who spread all the way across Europe and who have had a long-standing history of social exclusion and marginalization. It's been a, a, um, a quite interaction between their own identity and culture and the uh, negative reception that they've had in many, in many societies that's maintained them, in a sense, as a landless people. Uh, and a culture, therefore, that, rec that allows them to see themselves or necessitates to see themselves in that way. To some extent, that's been true of uh, Jews, for example, until uh, the creation of the State of Israel. For some Jews, that has given them a place, uh, a, a land that they belong to. But because of political processes in Europe and so on, for thousands of years, people were identified as landless people and were you know, wandering nomadic, in a sense. And that, I mean, it goes back to biblical times and to the creation of an identity uh, in which the place where you are is constructed by the group of people, not by the terrain. And in, in the case of Judaism, by the book. So you don't, with the destruction of the, the second temple, there's no longer a special place you go to. Any place that there are 10 adult males and the book is now the sacred place where, in a canopy where you can then have uh, religious services. So it's a different, I'm just contrasting that for a moment to think about what you, when you talk to indigenous people and they talk to you how important this specific place is and how much they're tied and this sense of phys physical connection to this place. And the notion that, which again resonates for everybody, whatever their background, to some degree, but which is, I think, in some ways different from people who are primarily urban people, who are very mobile people, and so on, have a different way of constructing their identity. Um, for many indigenous peoples, and again thinking of Canada, uh, North America, South America, many of those pe peoples uh, were not literate uh, for the longest part of their history until recently. So what that means is the transmission of cultural knowledge occurred in oral forms primarily. Things were not written down in a book, they were told as stories, as songs, as legends, in ritual ways from generation to generation. So that's a different way of organizing knowledge. There's a different epistemology uh, underneath that. How do you know to trust something? Uh, it's, I've had discussions with people, in, in indigenous people in Canada who talk about not trusting things that are written down on paper. Uh, because those were the treaties that were then reinterpreted in ways that were dis you know, disadvantageous for them. And, uh, and if you don't, can't read what's written down on the paper, then you, you totally suspect, you know, are suspicious. So it's sort of the same thing when you get a contract with you know, microscopic writing at the bottom. I think we all have that feel uneasy feeling of what's, what's in, the, you know, in, in the fine print, as it were. Uh, but that's a different attitude than traditions that are very rooted on a sacred text. The monotheistic traditions, let's say, that all have sacred texts where this is, you know, these are powerful words. These are, these are really to be trusted in a way. They're really deeply meaningful, even though there may be arguments about how to best to interpret them. There's a sense that uh, real knowledge is there, uh, as opposed to the idea that what, where real knowledge comes from is from a person you trust, and they can only talk about what they actually know. So to say, this, those are different epistemologies that are important to this day in some ways for people, even though uh, you now have uh, you know, people who are all, they're all literate and they all have these different uh, influences on them. Um, because of the history of colonization, because of the dynamics that I'll be describing in more detail in a moment, the, a lot of the key issues for indigenous people have to do with the usurpation of their land of their identity and of how to uh, restore it in, in, in some way. And so those become important issues for us to think about in terms of the dynamic uh, uh, effects on identity, on community solidarity, and the other ingredients that go into to health. There's also a very practical issue because <clears throat> um, indigenous peoples in many places are still to a larger degree than or, uh, other other populations rurally based or based in remote communities, often in small communities, there's a very complex logistical problem as to how do you provide services or how do you address the, the, the needs of groups that are very widely dispersed and living in small communities. So we'll, we'll come back to that at the end. So I mentioned that the term indigenous has become uh, an internationally recognized term and we, na we have a, uh, now a, a uh, declaration of uh, indigenous rights uh, coming from the United Nations. Uh, and in that discussion, uh, there's been a grappling with the same kinds of issues that I've just raised. So this is just a text from uh, the, some of the early uh, uh, UN Special Reporter documents on 
indigenous people leading toward these, these rights, uh, trying to define this in a way that would work across many contexts. And the contentious part of this for many people was it's fairly clear in Canada, the US, New Zealand, Australia, some other settler societies, what we mean by indigenous and what kind of historical problem has been created by the, the violence of colonization. Uh, if you go to a place like Africa or Southeast Asia, the meaning of indigenous people is much more complicated because there's a sense in which many, many people are indigenous, uh, and, but then the creation of nation states has required just pulling those people together. And so you're often talking about different dynamics between a dominant group and a subdominant group, both of whom might be from the region, or one of which is perceived as being uh, an interloper from a neighboring place, uh, and it's those local dynamics. So part of the anxiety when the United Nations is trying to work all this out was, if you interpret this very broadly, it's going to be destabilizing to a lot of African nations and so on, where many people can come forward and say, wait a minute, you know, we have indigenous rights that are not being respected by the, the dominant group that's running the government down there in that place. And of course, African societies, Asian societies are extremely diverse, notwithstanding the image that they have of, okay, the, this, is the, these, this is Indonesia, or this is the Philippines, or this is China, those national places are actually more diverse than Canada is uh, in terms of what's inside there. But we don't, we don't usually hear about it that way, but we have a very crude image that's represented in Western media, uh, and so um, the, the dilemmas that they're facing in terms of how to create a sense of national unity around extremely diverse peoples uh, were behind some of the anxiety about advancing uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. These are the specific points then. So they allowed for the possibility that there are many different ways of being indigenous, that you may be occupying ancestral lands, that you may have common ancestry with the original uh, occupants of the lands, that you may have a continuous culture of a kind, and that's what you're identifying yourself with, language, um, uh, um, and, and then other factors. So they kind of leave it open to a very uh, flexible uh, definition. So this just, this, um, um, graph just underscores the point I made about the diversity of other places and where uh, the largest numbers of indigenous peoples are. And it may be surprising to many people to see that China is the place that actually has the largest numbers of indigenous peoples. As I say, because of the nation building project, because of the dominance sort of historically of Han uh, Chinese, that China's just you know, seen as, uh, at least from a crude Western point of view, as fairly monolithic. We hear now and then about certain groups, you know, about uh, the, you know, the, uh, um, the uh, violent aggression against uh, Tibet on the part of China or the suppression of Uyghurs or uh, other, other groups, but we don't really hear the, the extreme diversity that actually exists within China that has been um, downplayed, in a sense, uh, in the nation-building process. Yeah. I think the key point is just to understand the places I'm going to be talking about here, United States and Canada, you see actually in terms of the global population represent small numbers of people in terms of who could be considered indigenous. So although I'll be talking about those dynamics, and they're certainly very relevant for our society and for uh, other societies, it's important to think about the fact that the dynamics for other groups and how they're retaining their culture or not and what their dilemmas are around, for example, the persistence of their languages and so on, uh, may be quite different in, in a, a context like China or one of the Southeast Asian nations. So uh, in Canada, and this is, I'll talk about, mainly about Canada, a little bit about Australia and New Zealand and, and the U.S., but mainly about Canada from, from here forward. Uh, in Canada, the term that is currently used uh, in, uh, to encompass the indigenous peoples in Canada is Aboriginal peoples. Uh, and that's a politically convenient term because of the fact that we have three broad groups of peoples uh, that are included under indigenous. First Nations, which is the politically correct term for people who used to be called uh, American Indians or uh, Canadian Indians, that is to say not East Indians, but people who are the indigenous people of Canada. So First Nations, uh, uh, Inuit, who are people who used to be called Eskimo, uh, uh, who live in the Arctic, and Métis, who are people of mixed descent, uh, particularly centered around a region in central Canada where they had a very distinct political history and so they see themselves as a circumscribed group. So even though there are lots more people who might be mixed, not all of whom view themselves as Métis, uh, there is a distinct political group or a series of groups, cultural groups, uh, in uh, Midwest Canada who identify as Métis and that term has been adopted more and more by other people who are mixed. So it's being used more loosely, although it had a, ver a, a more restricted um, a historical uh, origin in, in uh, uh, particular groups. And those are typically, historically, those are people 
of French or Franco-Canadian and uh, Amerindian uh, descent, uh, Amerindian, in this case, mainly Cree, Ojibwe, some other groups, Huron, other people uh, out east. So. Uh, and you see the relative proportions here roughly uh, uh, with about two-thirds of the Aboriginal people being uh, First Nations, about a third being Métis, and about uh, uh, 4% or so being Inuit. In Canada, this represents about 4% of the total population, and it's about 1.2 million people. Over 50%, even of those people who identify as Aboriginal, have mixed parentage. And that's framing it one way, of course. We could turn around the other way and say, so how many of the people who identify themselves as Euro-Canadian have mixed parentage? And my colleague, Julie Beau, has made the argument that in the case of uh, Quebecois, people who view themselves as uh, pure laine or de souche, you know, people from the original who can trace their histories back to the original settlers, there's probably none of them who don't have Amerindian blood because the first waves of migration were actually all men. There were no women until they sent some brides over. And when they sent those uh, filles de roi or whatever over later, in many cases the men had already formed liaisons and they ended up with two families. And they had a uh, family in a... Amerindian community, a family in the city. So you had, anyway, the point is all the complex dynamics, you had lots of mixing of people going on early on, and then people define themselves one way or the other, depending upon their skin color, depending upon where they live, uh, and so, you, but then you create a myth, a national myth of a certain kind of identity and even of purity, uh, and that sometimes doesn't acknowledge the real history. And I'm, say, I'm mentioning the history of Quebec, but you could tell similar or uh, equally uh, complex stories uh, about all the South American countries or all the Central American countries, uh, where you have people who are defining themselves as uh, Euro, uh, um, uh, South American, Central American, whatever, but who in fact uh, have mixed blood. And the important point about this is that the mixing and where people get assigned is not primarily based obviously on any genetic thing, it's based on uh, trajectories, social trajectories, and ways in which groups are being defined. Um, in Canada, the indigenous peoples are very, very diverse. Uh, there are uh, over 600 different bands. There are 11 major language groups. The languages are more different from each other than different European languages would be. Uh, and so, the notion that you have one group of people is a, a, confu a myth in a way, and it's something that's been created by the fact that many people were thrown into the same predicament, the same political situation. So the profound differences in their ways of life and so on are, are being, you know, become ignored in the face of the fact that they're all dealing with this experience of colonization and subjugation and so on. But prior to European uh, contact uh, in North and Central and South America, indigenous peoples here range from very small hunter-gatherer groups living in a nomadic way uh, where the entire unit of society might be 30 or 35 people, or basically one extended family and that was it. And maybe now and then you bumped into another family and uh, you know, there were intermarriages or whatever, but basically you lived in this uh, one uh, large uh, family group, uh, two things that were gigantic empires uh, with a very complex uh, political structure and uh, written language and, and other things. So you had this whole range in, in the Americas. Uh, in Canada, as, as elsewhere, we'll talk about uh, the indigenous population now is actually living mainly in the cities. More than half of the indigenous people in Canada live in cities. So the image, and we will talk about remote communities because this is something distinctive about uh, population, but it's not where the majority of people are living anymore. Uh, and uh, the reality is that if you walk out on the street, you don't know who you're bumping into uh, who's indigenous. In, in eastern Canada, uh, or in Quebec and you know, Montreal, I would say indigenous people are less visible uh, than they are if you go to western Canada, where you have higher concentrations of people, higher proportion of people, and it's more uh, visible in the uh, dynamics of everyday urban life and in the stratification and the marginalization, the sort of um, uh, creation of, of neighborhoods or ghettos or uh, other kinds of structures within the city that um, make it clear uh, where somebody uh, 
uh, belongs or where somebody's classified or categorized within the city. And this is an important dynamic. There are cities out west in Canada that are heading toward having a majority of indigenous people, which will be a very different dynamic, obviously, for, for how people uh, function. The other thing to say, and part of why that demography is changing, is that there's a high birth rate in the indigenous population. Uh, and so uh, that means both that the proportion is increasing and that it is generally a very young population. Uh, and that has implications for a variety of things. Uh, this is where people are distributed, roughly. I mean, this is from 10 years ago. But it hasn't changed uh, too much, although there are more people in the cities. Each of those dots represents a sort of population center. The size and the uh, color, uh, uh, darkness of the color, represents the, um, the uh, number of people living there. Uh, and um, you can see that uh, people are spread out all over the country. If I was to show you where the Euro-Canadian population is, it would be mostly hugging the border with the U.S. Um, so in terms of you know, this very large uh, landmass, who is sort of covering all of it, it's mostly indigenous people. And they often make that claim that if they ever want to really you know, uh, challenge Canadian sovereignty, I mean, they're the ones who are, you know, have the flag planted on the land in, in, in most parts of the country. Uh, this is the um, First Nations, here it's called North American Indian, uh, but the First Nations population. Uh, and then, I don't know if I have the slide here, this is the Inuit uh, population, uh, which is virtually all above the, uh, above the uh, Arctic Circle or above the, the, snow, the tree line, basically, not the Arctic Circle, but the tree line in terms of the um, ecosystem that people live in. Um, something interesting that happened in Canada in quite recent years was the creation of a new territory, uh, Nunavut, which involves the eastern Arctic in the north, uh, which is now a an, uh, an, uh, separate political entity in a sense. It has its own legislature, uh, and it is predominantly Inuit run. In fact, if you go to the legislature there and sit in the, the, um, the uh, assembly, um, uh, people uh, talk in Inuktitut uh, English and French, so you have uh, simultaneous translation, primarily into an English in this case, but anyway, you have three official languages. And the throne for the uh, um, governor general uh, has a nice, beautifully carved narwhal horn at the base of it, and so on. So you have a sense of um, participation in this democratic process, but a particularly Inuit version of it. So this is an interesting uh, development. And it's something that I think will run through this whole discussion, is that you'll hear in recent years there have been serious um, political efforts to recognize the, the dilemmas and the past injustices vis-a-vis -vis indigenous people and to do some things to correct that. And in that sense, I would say indigenous people have more political voice at the moment than do migrants. I mean, we're in the moment, we're in a, on the verge of having our government roll back some of the basic health care that's provided to refugee claimants. Uh, and there's a sense that, I mean, refugee claimants have no voice of their own. They're completely vulnerable in this situation, whereas indigenous people have developed a certain level of voice. So we can learn something in terms of other groups that, uh, you know, uh, need advocacy in some ways, we can learn something from, from that history and from those politics that may also help uh, some other uh, segments of society. Um, the, well, the borders reflect, uh, I mean, what you have uh, left is the, uh, is the uh, Yukon and um, uh, and uh, Northwest Territories, so that's basically how it was defined. There are other Inuit populations in, uh, to the west, I mean, and then you have Nunavik, which is northern Quebec, and so that's also an Inuit population. This is Nunavik, which is northern Quebec above the tree line. It does not have the same political status, and in 1976, as part of the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement, jurisdiction for that area passed from the federal government for, for education, health care, and it would pass from the, the federal government to Quebec. Uh, so that was part of an overall agreement that was already Quebec territory, but there was a, a, a responsibility on the part of the federal government to provide uh, basic services, and there was a sort of renegotiation of that as part of uh, 
um, agreements that you know, occurred around uh, control of the North. I don't think so. I mean, first of all, Quebec would not be happy to give up that territory at all. Yeah. Uh, and um, even though, in fact, it's uh, some of the same families, I mean, there are people who go between Saluet, the northernmost part of, of Quebec, and Cape Dorset. It's essentially the same network of families that move between there. And it's the same culture and essentially the same language. There's small dialect differences, but their dialect, because these were relatively isolated populations, hard to move from community to community, there actually are little di dialect differences from community to community. And there's a wonderful uh, uh, Quebec uh, scholar and uh, linguist, uh, Louis Jacques Doré, who, who can actually do these dialects. I, I think that's an amazing phenomenon that he can, uh, you know, he can both recognize them, but he can actually produce them himself. So I think that's quite wonderful. But uh, this is an image of Saluet in the north, the northernmost community in, in Quebec. Uh, so it gives you a, an idea of what we're talking about in terms of uh, small remote communities. Um, at the time that this was taken, I think there were uh, about 800 people living in Saluet, it's a little bit more now. Uh, and you can't see it very clearly here. It's in a bit of a valley, there's a little bit of a hill, and that's quite atypical. In general, uh, the uh, Inuit prefer uh, to live in more open spaces. Uh, and in fact, many people in Saluet, when we were doing ethnographic work there, were telling us uh, actually, we have more mental health problems here because of the uh, hills, because it makes people feel closed in, and that's not good for people. So you have a kind of ethno-psychology that is very much tied to a sensitivity to the environment and to a notion of a certain kind of environment. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, because I think that's one of the interesting things that one gets out of uh, understanding indigenous notions of self and personhood to the extent that they are connected to land is a kind of ecocentric concept of the person uh, and a kind of uh, thinking of the self in terms of not only relationships with human beings but of relationships to the land and the land means not just the land like a dead place but a living place around you plants animals uh, environmental energies and spirits and so on, this sense of, a, of the environment being very alive and of human beings existing in a very intense and intimate interaction. And just to give you the example of that, flying into this community one day, uh, going uh, over the fjords, uh, a man sitting next to me you know, uh, said, you know, I know that coastline better than the palm of my own hand. So you have this sense of intimacy with place that, again, most urban people, I guess we all say, well, I know that street you know, has my favorite you know, uh, restaurant on it, but it's not the same uh, feeling of connection. And as I say, it goes quite deep in terms of what people think makes you well, makes you sick, and so on. And we'll come back to this at length. Uh, in the summer, you can get to these communities by boat. They're all mostly on the coastline, in the case of Inuit, because the, it's, uh, that's where you can fish and, and hunt uh, sea mammals. Uh, in the winter, the only way to get to these communities uh, is, uh, is by plane. There is uh, some communities you can get from one community to another by ski if you're really on a, ready for an arduous trip. But in terms of things coming from the south or whatever, they all have to come by plane. And it used to be very small planes. Gradually, the planes are getting bigger. The airstrips are getting better. But when I started working there in the late 80s, this was how you got in and out of the communities kind of with these planes. So. Just to go on with this portrait for a moment, because I think it helps those of you who have not been to this part of the world and you know, to have a more vivid image. I mean, the communities are, are, as I say, very small. The first waves of colonization in this context were missionaries and traders, uh, or maybe traders and missionaries in that order. Uh, and so you had people who were uh, coming from the Hudson Bay Company and trading for furs with people, and very soon uh, before or after you had missionaries coming to save souls. Uh, and the Inuit in this case were virtually 100% converted to Christianity. Uh, the process of conversion was interesting because for the most part they were told all that stuff you believe about the spirits and the sea spirit and all that, it's all true but that's all from the devil. And now we'll give you the good word. Uh, and it worked very well, uh, and so that you have Today, people who are, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, clearly Christian, in many cases devoutly Christian, uh, and compared to southern groups who have undergone significant amount of revival and, and trying to recoup their traditions, uh, there is somewhat less of that, at least in terms of religious and spiritual traditions, less of that among Inuit who have re uh, remained uh, more identified with Christianity. 
the early missionaries were uh, Catholic and Anglican. Uh, then you've had later waves, and most recently of Pentecostalism. So in some of these small communities, you actually have three churches or three congregations, not always three separate buildings, sometimes two things are being shared. And so religious life is an important part of people's experience in terms of social belonging and, and participation. Um, the, uh, traditionally, people lived in uh, snow houses in the, in the winter, in, in igloos, and in tents uh, in the summer. Uh, with, uh, and, and then people began, as they, they began to have more stable communities in one place, usually built up around a trading post, people would build these sort of shacks uh, out of plywood or whatever's available. This is above the tree line, there are no trees, so any wood that anybody has has to come from somewhere else. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in terms of you know, working with materials. Uh, and, uh, but with, in Quebec, with the uh, James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement in 1976, there was a transfer of funds and people began to be able to build uh, new houses. The, the province built new houses. So you have these new um, uh, multi-family dwellings that were built. You can see uh, them here. This is, I think, a Kulovic. Uh, and um, those big buildings house usually four different units. Uh, so there would be four families living in those units. They're built on stilts above the permafrost because uh, if you put them directly on the ground, they would melt the ground and sink into the ground. Uh, and everything has to be brought to and from those houses. So sewage has to be taken away, water has to be brought to them again because of the environment. There's no running water possible in an environment that's frozen for most of the year. Uh, the houses are you know, nicely constructed, uh, sealed houses as a result the air inside is incredibly dry, uh, and so people are prone to upper respiratory tract infections. So creating an environment that looks like a nice suburban environment for people ecologically becomes a problem as a result of having recurrent uh, uh, respiratory tract infections. Uh, children uh, get recurrent ear infections, and you end up with a high rate of people with deafness because they've had multiple uh, otitis media. So this kind of... Um, well-intentioned, we could say, and uh, you know, attempt to give people uh, some material comfort uh, in a certain way ends up not fitting the context well and having unintended health consequences. Uh, so it's an interesting issue to keep in mind. It's a, I'm giving you a physical health issue. It's an interesting question to ask whether things happen on other levels as well that are maybe a bit harder to see, but there could be dilemmas in terms of whether it really fits people's, uh, people's needs. This is an image of what's now just a shack, but in the past might have been a dwelling. Uh, and uh, these are what the new dwellings look like. Um, and these are the fridges lined up to be installed inside the houses. So you have this slightly ironic situation uh, where most of the year you don't need a fridge, really. You could just leave your fish outside and they would be pretty frozen. Uh, but now that you've created a nice warm space inside, uh, you have to do that. I say nice warm space. The reality is an igloo, a snow house, is very warm inside. And in fact, people used to wear almost no clothes inside. They used to strip down. They would just wear like a you know, little cloth or whatever because it was so hot inside just from a little uh, 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 seal oil, whale oil uh, lamp uh, because it's, it's well sealed. But anyway, it's this ironic thing. Somebody just told me recently that they heard me give a talk 15 years ago in Australia and they remembered this slide because it just struck them as so ironic. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, this is the hospital in Pavernatuk in, in, uh, in northern Quebec uh, that is uh, uh, at the time, and again this would go back to the early 90s, was this very high-tech marvel that I think was a modular thing brought in from somewhere else. When something broke down they had to have somebody come from, a technician come from California to fix it or whatever. Uh, and uh, it, uh, this was a community of about 1,000 people or 900 to 1,000 people at the time. And these are images now from a, a Kaluit, which is the, um, the largest city in, uh, in Nunavut, uh, and which is um, really becoming, that's the general hospital in, in Iqaluit, really becoming a different kind of almost urban space in terms of the, the size and complexity of the community. So as I mentioned, so that's just to give you an image of, and this is the case of the Inuit. I'll, I'll show you some other images later from First Nations communities, but just to give you a bit of a notion of where some uh, of the uh, indigenous people in Canada live, in this case in the, in the far north, uh, and how 
different that environment is and how much it reflects both their traditional way of living. In the case of the Inuit, they were nomadic people. In fact, they did not have fixed communities, although they were named by a region where they would live, so people would be referred to as the people of so-and-so from that area. Uh, they had a, an annual migratory uh, pattern that was based on the kind of hunting and, and, uh, and so on that they would do at different times of the year. And the, these fixed communities becoming sedentary has been part of the process of colonization, in particular when the Canadian government said, okay, well, because you're Canadian citizens, we have to give you proper education and health care. But to do that, you have to be in one place. So people were basically herded uh, up and plunked in one place and said, now you're going to have to live here. And those places were chosen you know, because they had been trading posts, because there was some other geographic reason. Uh, but in the case of the Inuit, again, because it was a very small-scale society in which you had independent bands of people moving around uh, based around single families, these communities put people together who had never lived together before. Uh, and had no particular cultural forms or ways of life that fit that pattern. So they've really had to invent and develop and adapt new modes of coexistence and of negotiation and of problem solving and of power distribution and so on. And I think this is an ongoing process because these things have occurred in the last 50 to 60 years. When I started working again in the <coughs> late uh, 80s, early 90s in northern Quebec, the head of the hospital was a woman who'd been born on the land in an igloo. So that is still the case. I mean, um, uh, Mary Simon, a great spokesperson for the uh, Inuit and for the circumpolar uh, peoples, uh, was born in an igloo. So you have a whole, you know, people who are middle-aged and older who had a re relatively traditional lifestyle at the beginning, at least in their early childhood. Uh, so it's a very, very recent uh, uh, transition uh, in, in the case of this population. These are just figures to show you, and I mentioned before that uh, over 50% of uh, Aboriginal peoples in Canada now live in cities, and this shows you how that plays out in terms of um, percentages. Winnipeg, which is a much smaller city than uh, Toronto, uh, Montreal, Vancouver, has a larger number of Indigenous peoples. So when you walk out on the street, you, you have a, a, a different sense of the represent, uh, representativeness or, uh, or presence of Indigenous people, and that makes for different dynamics, similarly for Saskatoon and so on. Um, now, why should we be interested beyond just you know, being interested in diversity and, and all the rich and interesting cultures that make up the world? Why should we be concerned from a health point of view and a mental health point of view uh, in Indigenous people? Um, these are the uh, figures for infant mortality uh, in diverse indigenous groups with the general population in the lighter bar and the indigenous population in the darker bar. And what you can see is across the board, there are large discrepancies uh, between infant mortality for the general population and for indigenous populations. Uh, the worst ones here are in places in Africa and in uh, South America, uh, but uh, in the case of Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, it's also quite significant. It just doesn't look so clear on this because of the scale of the, of the, the graph. So here it is uh, on the, uh, this is now not infant mortality, but life expectancies uh, for the general population and for uh, indigenous people, male and female. And you can see very significant differences uh, across the board, in this case in Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand. What you can also see here is that the discrepancies are greater for Australia and least for New Zealand, and Canada being somewhere in the middle for the most part. And so it's interesting to think about why would that be the case. Uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand were all um, parts of the British Commonwealth. Uh, in the late 1800s, they all received from Britain a white paper, policy paper, telling them what to do with the indigenous people problem problem. You know, this was a problem of how to deal with these people. They were backward. They were not uh, doing well. What should we do with them? And the basic policy answer was forced assimilation. You need to get these people to become good Europeans. And the way to do that is through education, but not education in their homes or in their communities, because that'll just perpetuate their backward ways. We need to get them out of their communities and into institutions where they can be taught how to be good mm. Europeans. 
There's some very good uh, representations of this in film now. Uh, there's a good Australian film called Rabbit Proof Fence you have a chance to see that shows the, this uh, process. So what this got translated into was a system of residential schools, which I'll describe more in a moment, but which had a profound impact on the population. So between the processes of colonization, the uh, discrepancies between the lifestyles of people who are living in urban centers, have access to resources, and are um, able to um, uh, uh, maintain their health, and the predicament of indigenous peoples in being uh, uh, marginalized and having experienced a variety of kinds of disadvantage, you find this significant difference in the health of the populations. So in Canada, again, in life expectancy, there's roughly a seven-year gap. Uh, that is to say, people live significantly it's partly infant mortality, it's partly later things. Um, there are much higher rates of disability, higher rates of diabetes, uh, tuberculosis, much higher rates of death by injuries and poisonings, and anywhere from uh, six to ten times the rate of suicide across the board. I mean, it, it varies on from community to community, it varies with age range and so on. So these are always very rough statistics until you specify something a bit more, you can be a bit more precise, but just to give you an idea of the scope of the problems. So I've mentioned already that there is a, this high level of diversity uh, of indigenous peoples in Canada, and this also might explain why we have some of these differences across Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Canada in health and well-being. The country that has fared the best uh, facing the same kind of colonizing forces is New Zealand. And New Zealand essentially has one indigenous people, Maori. Even though it was a warring clan society, so people weren't all getting on smoothly all the time, they were fighting each other, they were killing each other sometimes, uh, they all spoke the same language, had the same religion, uh, they had interrelationships. Uh, and even though they were nearly decimated, and in fact around the turn of the, the 19, uh, 1900 or so, the expectation was that they would eventually disappear, in fact they made a big comeback and now represent upwards of 17% of the population of, of New Zealand. So that is a very particular dynamic. You have a single people representing 17% of the country. You can imagine the politics are quite different once those people take their voice and begin to assert it. And in fact, New Zealand has become officially a bilingual, bicultural nation. And every child, Pakia children, European descent children, learn Maori language in school. So it's a very different dynamic in terms of what a Maori person would feel as a member of that society. They would feel a certain level of recognition, a certain level of voice in the larger society, even though there's still plenty of discrimination or the problems people are struggling with. The other extreme is Australia that had very small scale societies, many different cultures, many different languages, very widely spread out across great regions, uh, and then uh, a very harsh policy of, um, of uh, colonial domination, even to the extent of out and out systematic genocide. I mean, in Tasmania, one separate island, this one uh, part, one state in, in Australia, essentially all of the Aboriginal people were killed. It was completely wiped out. Uh, I don't recall the period of time, but there were m periods where people literally linked hands and walked through the bush and shot every Aboriginal person they found. So there were a variety of forces and efforts that, that went on, but the net effect was completely wiping out all the Aboriginal people in that, in that region. Other areas, people have persisted and, and so on, but there, is, uh, there was a, a very harsh uh, process of suppression. Uh, in Canada, you have a demographic uh, situation that's a bit more like Australia in the sense that you have many different groups, different languages, very widely spread out. You had different colonial dynamics to some degree. Uh, there were differences in particular between Eastern and Western Canada. I mentioned already this sort of history of Quebec of the uh, process of intermarriage and intermingling, and to some extent it's true that in Eastern Canada there were more cordial and more, uh, what can we say, more... Um, tolerant or more accepting or more engaged relationships between European settlers and uh, Aboriginal uh, peoples. So there were you know, more love relationships and so on going on in the early phases of this. It made for a different uh, dynamic. Uh, I think there are complex reasons why the dynamics differ in different parts of the country over time. Uh, so I would see Canada both on this political level in terms of 
are you one group that can uh, stand up for itself and sort of form common cause, or are you being splintered and dispersed? Uh, and in terms of the colonial policies, as being somewhere between uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia in terms of how this dynamic has unfolded over time. And that probably accounts in some ways historically for this difference. There's another cultural dimension to this, and much of this, I have to say, is pure speculation because you, it's very hard to prove causal processes with this kind of historical events that are just one-off. There's nothing to compare them to. You're just looking over time and guessing what might have been going on in these complex processes. Um, but one interesting difference, again, thinking in, within Canada about those groups that have fared relatively well and those that have fared rel um, poorly in terms of the whole process of colonization, uh, is a notion that um, there are groups that were warrior societies that had complex uh, uh, political structures uh, and that they probably have fared on average somewhat better in negotiating or setting up some boundaries and protecting themselves vis-a-vis -vis the colonizers. I mean, it varies because obviously if you're a war society, you could also uh, provoke the colonizers and, you know, into a real effort to just wipe you out systematically, and that also happened. Uh, but if you think of the Iroquois nations, for example, uh, Haudenosaunee that uh, actually had a very complex political structure. There have actually been some books written that suggest that there are elements of the American Constitution and the structure of American political system that were borrowed from the Iroquois uh, political system. So you had a very complex society, and you had ways of protecting the boundaries. It's very dramatic uh, among the Maori, for example. Again, there's another wonderful film uh, to see that's uh, in, enlightening in some respects um, on contemporary Maori culture called The Whale Rider. If you have a chance to see that, it's about uh, a young woman who's uh, um, in succession for the, uh, the ch ch uh, to, to be a kind of chief, but except that women are not supposed to have that role, so it's a kind of moment of gender change or gender role change kind of in society, which is interesting. But uh, what you see in that is this process that exists, this ritual process, when uh, someone comes to visit uh, another community, and you come to the marae, to the kind of longhouse, which is the meeting place, and uh, when you come in as another group, there's a process of singing, of call and response back and forth, uh, in which you sing out things and they sing back, and you come closer and closer, and it's a process of uh, deciding whether it's safe to visit on both sides. Uh, and in fact, traditionally, the women would go in front and the men would be behind. The men would be ready to you know, do battle with the women as shields, I guess, if it got... Uh, you know. um, when you finally are invited into the marae, uh, you then uh, have... There's a ritual process in which people then uh, sing songs and recite poems and so on that speak to their identity. Everyone's located in their identity in relation to a clan, but also in relation to a mountain and a river. So this speaks to the ecocentric sense of identity. That's how you d define who you are. Uh, and you t do these things. And then finally, after you've sort of told each other who you are and identified yourself, you will greet each other with a hungi where you actually put your foreheads together. So you're like this with another person, forehead to forehead, and your breaths mingle. Uh, so you've gone from this great distance, uh, is it safe, to through a, in a very ritual process to finally in this very intimate uh, physical contact uh, with people. And so I think that's an interesting example, also a metaphor for the whole process of how do you deal with strangers and how do you negotiate that. Uh, and the notion that those societies, that because they were war societies, because they had their own internal dilemmas about how to deal with dangerous people within the larger society and how to negotiate that, may have had some ritual tools, some conceptual tools, some um, uh, ways of handling uh, other people that would help them a little bit in fighting and negotiating, uh, fighting for political rights, negotiating, and so on later on. The uh, other extreme would be very small, isolated uh, hunter-gatherer groups that don't have much, don't, haven't developed much of that kind of cultural apparatus because they don't have to. You know, for thousands of years they're living with just a few people around. You don't have to have a big complex political system to deal with things. You have other ways of resolving conflict and so on. Faced now with this thing of encountering this very large, complex, uh, uh, invading society, uh, you're a, at a bit of a loss. I mean, individually you can be creative and learn the whole thing, but you don't have a lot of your own uh, tradition and tools to draw from immediately to sort of solve that problem. And I think the risk of being just overrun in a way is, is, is greater. In fact, take another small example from with, uh, within that, and I think it's interesting in terms of other in aspects of what we're talking about in this course. Jane Briggs is an anthropologist uh, uh, at Memorial University in Newfoundland who worked a lot with Inuit in the central Arctic. She wrote a whole ethnography of emotion called Never in Anger. Uh, 
which is about Inuit emotion. It was one of the first uh, anthropological book uh, ethnographies that focused ex just on emotional life of a, of a group. And one of the things she talks about is uh, that Inuit have two words for fear, two kinds of fear. Uh, and one is um, uh, kapia, which is the kind of fear you feel when you're facing a physically dangerous situation. Let's say you're walking out on thin ice and you don't know if it's going to break under you. So the appropriate response is to be cautious and careful and to test the situation, make sure it's safe. The other term for fear or anxiety is ilira, which is the fear you feel when you face a person you don't know. Uh, and the correct response to that is that you smile and ingratiate yourself to the person. So it's interesting then to read the documents of the early explorers meeting the Inuit who say, oh, what a lovely people, they're so sweet, they're all smiling and friendly. <laughs> So, and to think that there's something a little more complex was going on there, which I think is often the case. You know, this is often that people say, oh, I went to India, everybody was smiling and happy all the time with me, you know. It's a little bit of a distorted picture you're getting because people are trying to manage you. I mean, for sure, if some of it may be people are being pleasant and feeling good and whatever, but you don't really know the complexities of how they're figuring out how to deal with this unknown quantity who's not part of the system, who doesn't know the rules and who you have to just find the appropriate way of dealing with it. The point I'm trying to make, though, aside from this interesting issue about carving up emotions in different ways and how emotion terms, even though fear, we might say something like fear is a universal, every human being has some notions of fear, but kinds of fear and what the right thing to do with certain kinds of fear actually varies significantly, and here's, here's one example. Um, but also the notion that that attitude toward uh, the strange other is very different, let's say, than the Maori example I just gave you where you know you stand your ground and you make a fierce face and you, you shout out these songs and you're really protecting your boundary and you could imagine again if you translate that, that to the negotiating table uh, that one style is going to get you a bit further than the other given the aggressiveness of your, your, uh, your partner. So these are I think issues that may have played a role in how then the whole colonial apparatus uh, had such a profound impact on people's lives, but had to some degree a differential impact. That is, not every group was affected to the same degree in the same way. There are lots of other reasons, obviously, uh, many of which have to do just with the extent to which certain groups were targeted or were sitting on land that somebody really wanted and therefore uh, you know, faced a much more aggressive uh, intervention. Just a few more words about the diversity of the population. And again, I'm using the example of Canada, but you could do the same thing for any part of the world we're talking about where you could begin to map that and understand that this maybe crude category that's being used for one group is not really about one group. It's only being lumped together because it's being looked at from the point of view of somebody who doesn't really know uh, what's going on. The other thing is interesting, though, because Canada is a very big place, the diversity in Canada also represents... Uh, not only linguistic diversity or cultural diversity, but it represents ecological diversity, as people are living in very, very different environments, and so they have very different cultures uh, in, in relation to that. So this is a way of grouping the, uh, the uh, indigenous peoples of Canada that basically is a kind of biogeographical uh, division. This is an older division, but it, it has some validity in terms of lifestyles. Uh, so you see the purplish one is people living in the Arctic above the tree line. And then you have this very large subarctic region, which is a kind of um, boreal region where you have some forest, but you have very rugged land, not very fertile land in the sense it's quite rocky, a lot of this and stuff. So people are mainly hunters uh, in that zone. And then you notice the green on the west coast. This is a very fertile area, lots of forest, lots of game lots of fish. Th these are, there are many, many different cultural groups in British Columbia because it was probably a bit easier to take care of your basic needs, so you had lots more time and energy to do things like carve giant totem poles or do other things that are you know, associated with some of those cultures on, on, on the West Coast. Uh, and then you have some uh, other groups, and uh, you see the Atlantic uh, regions around lakes and, and uh, ocean and so on. This is a map of language groups, and you see a rough correspondence there. Uh, because, again, the boundaries are being defined partly by a lifestyle that fits a certain ecological context, and what's going with that is uh, one of these language groups. Um, you see the Inuit in Uktitut goes all the way from, uh, from uh, Alaska to Greenland, to the east coast of Greenland. So it's actually the people with the widest latitude distribution of any ethnic group or whatever in the world. 
And what's interesting to think about that also, just to say one more word about that, is that how that was populated was by people traveling by small kayak boats and whatever, all the way from first coming over the Bering Strait and then going all the way over to uh, uh, Greenland and then back again. And actually, we ha that's a later migration than the uh, migration of the Amerindian peoples. We believe that all the indigenous peoples of the Americas came from uh, Siberia and that region over the Bering uh, Strait. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, First Nations or other indigenous peoples, uh, you know, uh, 10 to 15,000 years ago. In the case of the Inuit, uh, 5,000 years ago. So it's a much later, way, more recent uh, wave of migration. And in fact, the Inuit migrated across uh, the north all the way to Greenland and then back migrated. So you have you had one culture in the north, the Dorset culture. You can find archaeologically traces of this culture. And then you had the Thule people back migrating who had a more uh, advanced or technologically sophisticated uh, hunting and uh, culture and essentially wiped out or absorbed the Dorset people. And in the case of northern Quebec, this happened probably in the 14 to 1500s. So it's quite recent. And it's interesting that in oral history in Quebec, people, Inuit in Quebec, will talk about the Tunit, who are the people who were there before the Inuit, who they say were scared away by the Inuit. And it's possible that those, that's actually oral history recollection of this process of the Thule culture displacing the, the Dorset culture just 500 years ago. So the history I've been outlining to you in a somewhat unsystematic way, but making, I think, some important key points is of this process of colonization. What gets described from the European point of view is the discovery of the Americas. Uh, what from an indigenous point of view would be the invasion of the Americas uh, and colonization. Uh, that that colonization uh, was a process uh, uh, that had profound impact on the indigenous people of the Americas. Uh, the estimates are uh, we, we, the anywhere, there were anywhere from about 10 million to 100 million people living in the Americas before the Europeans came. Uh, and on the order of about 80 to 90 percent of those people died as a result of contact with the Europeans. So there are some estimates that say this is, in, in terms of our knowledge, historical knowledge, that this is the largest dying out of human populations in, in, in history. Uh, most of that was not from direct and deliberate uh, uh, murder or genocide. Most of it was from infectious diseases. Uh, the European colonizers had been living in cities for several hundred years. Cities are good uh, uh, vessels for cultivating all kinds of uh, infectious agents. Uh, and what happened in this context was that um, uh, the colonizers came and spread uh, you know, viruses and bacteria that then wiped out the population. And if you look at early historical records, you'll find descriptions of, you know, whole communities decimated with some kind of thing like smallpox or, you know, measles or some other thing that's kind of uh, wiping out the population. And this is what happened in uh, uh, northern, central, and South America. And in fact, it's credited for the reason why the Spanish were able to essentially colonize uh, uh, Central and South America was because of that, because they were a small ragtag group of people, but each time, you know, with Cortes, each time before he got to the next village, half the people had died already from infectious disease that was sort of preceding him, and so they were actually able to dominate and bring down this enormous empire that, in fact, had, you know, uh, was quite strong, but which was just uh, uh, destroyed. Um, so this is very important, because this is, again, has had an impact on communities. It disrupted the strength and solidity of those communities. It disrupted the transmission of culture. And it left the indigenous peoples in this very um, uh, fragile state. Um, in the process, uh, another force going on in parallel was the, for the, the pro economic process of trading, of exchange. And the Europeans had things that were interesting and uh, appealing to the indigenous peoples. And so indigenous peoples began to reorganize their lives in relationship to trading processes. So for example, in, in uh, Quebec and northern Quebec and other parts of Canada, people who were traditionally hunters and who were hunting for their own needs to get food, to get clothing, to get other things, began to hunt to feed the European market for certain kinds of fur. So people said, well, fox makes a very nice hat or coat or whatever. 
and fox, which was not a major uh, animal that people would hunt because it didn't give them much meat or other things that they wanted, so they would do a little bit of fox for decoration, but it would not became a very important uh, um, cash uh, commodity, or, or not cash, but trade commodity. And so people changed their hunting patterns in response to that. So much so that in the late 1920s, uh, when the Great Depression occurred and the market crash, the Inuit and other groups who had survived for thousands of years in a steady, more or less steady state uh, taking care of themselves experienced starvation because they had shifted their whole pattern of hunting. So they came to the trading post and said, okay, here are all the furs. And they were told, sorry, we can't give you anything for this. So it's an interesting story again of how people get uh, uh, connected to a global economy, having lived in their own balance, in their own uh, you know, uh, sustainable fashion, if you will, for a quite a long time, now become embroiled in a global economy, an economy that doesn't have much interest or concern for them specifically, that's operating on other agendas, uh, and then they're then vulnerable to, to this whole uh, process. Point to be made about that, though, is it's not, this is not just about the sort of uh, uh, nefarious actions of uh, transnational uh, trading corporations a uh, hundred years ago. It's also everyone's human desire that is, is coming out of uh, indigenous people's own desire to get certain goods, to have access to tea and sugar and uh, uh, rifles and all these other commodities that, that are very attractive to people, and that also lead to changes in how they function. The introduction of uh, rifles and bullets totally changed the nature of hunting for people. The introduction of skidoos and gasoline, uh, you know, 50 years later, totally changed the nature of transportation and hunting in, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, so, but it also at the same time creates interrelationships and, in, and dependencies that then become new, new dilemmas for people in terms of how they're going to go forward. Uh, so there's a process of sedentarization going on of nomadic peoples. Not all indigenous peoples are nomadic, as I mentioned. You had agrarian peoples with large farms, and, and you had uh, other kinds of uh, ways of organizing groups. But most of the northern peoples in those subarctic and arctic regions were basically nomadic peoples who survived by hunting, by moving around where the game was, knowing the cycles of the animals themselves and following them and hunting different things at different times of the year. Those groups all became sedentarized through this process of relationship to the trading post, uh, relationship to the uh, religious mission, eventually relationship to uh, settlements that the government insisted they had to be in so that they would get education and medical care. And that is a profound change. To go from being a nomadic type of person to a sedentary person, Cecil may have talked about this in another context because this happens in migration. There are people who migrate to Canada now, who immigrate to Canada or come as refugees from people who in their original countries were nomadic peoples. And they have very different ways of dealing with something like urban space or social networks and so on. And they're often misunderstood and often become dilemmas for people in terms of how to adapt to this new environment. You have other examples. You have, in the Middle East, you have Bedouin, uh, who were nomadic peoples, who were increasingly sedentarized and living in encampments and so on. Uh, uh, last year I was in, um, uh, visiting uh, Israel and I went to Rahat, which is the largest Bedouin city. Uh, and uh, Rahat is organized in such a way that if you go to, I was visiting the al Kranawi family, so the al Kranawi family has all of their houses all neighboring each other, uh, in the same as you essentially have a tent encampment. These are all very nice, you know, homes are very well appointed. But in the central area, in the middle, uh, is also the place where uh, they have some goats and they have other things that would have fit that, that past pattern. So you have a new urban space and a thriving uh, urban environment uh, that is built on the model of a nomadic encampment. So if you have the opportunity to create that kind of urban space, then maybe you have an easier transition. That is to say, you can create vernacular architecture, you can create forms of uh, family homes, forms of communal life that allow you to maintain some continuity with your traditions and with your way of living. It may make a transition from being nomadic to being sedentary a bit easier. If you choose to do it at a certain point in time, it's another thing. But to the extent that you're forced, to the extent that you're not dictating the pace, that your community doesn't have a chance to develop these structures, there's going to be a lot of stress and strain uh, associated with going from such a, a different way of organizing life. These processes, which were going on anyway, as I say, with a push and pull between uh, what the fur traders wanted and what uh, the indigenous people wanted and, and kind of these negotiations, were profoundly 
uh, accelerated and sort of moved to a different level through this process that I just talked about of the forced assimilation. The idea now that it's not enough that people just sort of find their own wending way to find new forms of life over time, but that this must be uh, bureaucratically controlled and accelerated because it's an obligation of the state in some way. Uh, and, uh, and that led to a residential school system. So in Canada, as in uh, Australia, New Zealand, whatever, for 100 years we had a residential school system for Indigenous people in which young children were taken out of their homes and put in schools uh, far away from their families with little contact with their families where they could learn to be good Europeans, basically. They're forbidden to speak their language, to practice their religion, to wear any of their clothes. In the case of um, uh, groups that had uh, um, long hair, which was an issue for children, then there was a certain hair cutting ceremony, a certain age and so on you're supposed to do. Uh, their hair was cut when they went to school. The other reason you would cut your hair was uh, if somebody had died in your family. So for some of these children, when their hair was cut, they were horrified and thought that somebody had died in their family. The people who were doing this were mostly not aware of those things or not concerned with those things. And so there were many ways in which uh, this became a, a huge problem. The goal was really to get every child, uh, from the government's point of view. Uh, from a family, the family's positions varied. Some families were happy and interested that, great, my kid has a chance to get a good education. And so they, they sent their kids there or encouraged the, the process. Uh, families who didn't feel that way uh, had little say in the matter, and their children were taken from them forcibly. Five years. Yeah. And you can see again, and if you see the film Rabbit Proof Fence, it's about this process in Australia. And there's a very painful scene where literally a mother is holding onto the child, and the school officials are dragging the child out of her hands and bundling the child in a car and driving off. This is based on a true story, this, this film, a specific true story. Uh, and was, if you have a chance to see this, get it on DVD and watch the extras. There's a making of it film. And the making of it film is very, very enlightening. First of all, uh, uh, because of the search for the young girls to play. This is a story, the true story is of three young girls who escaped from this residential school and walked uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles across the Australian outback to get home. And it's called Rabbit Proof Fence because there was a huge fence through the middle of the outback to stop the rabbits from going from one part of the country to another. And they basically follow that fence to find their way home. Uh, and it's very moving. At the end of the film, you see these three old ladies who are the actual girls of the story. Basically, it's very touching to see. It really sort of drives the point home in a way. Um, but to find these wonderful child actors who, who play these, they're really, the center is just these three kids, so they, the whole film rests on their thing, although Kenneth Branagh plays the, the, uh, the head of the uh, colonial policy of the, to, to uh, you know, which is interesting in itself because he pr portrays, I mean, these people were do-gooders. They thought they were doing the right thing. So you see him as he thinks he's doing the right thing, even though from our point of view at the present moment, it's like horrifying to see what, what he's doing. Uh, so you see the, in, in this making of it film, you see the process of selecting these child actors and you see the dilemmas for these actors in playing this role and in particular for one of the, the oldest of the three girls at one point, I think she has to have her hair cut for the thing and you see the devastating effect this is having on her sense of self. So it's interesting that here's an actor, she's play acting, et cetera, et cetera, and yet you can see there's still complex identity issues that get activated when you're put in this kind of environment. The other aspect is you see this filming of the scene I just described where the child's being forcibly taken out of the mother's hands, and you see what that was actually like for the people participating who collapse at the end on the ground weeping, because the, the actress who's playing this role of the mother was herself uh, taken away to school. In Australia, that whole process that's called the stolen generation, the people were taken away uh, from their, their families, stolen generations. Um, I, I won't go through, this is just some of the actual uh, historical uh, documents and events that led to this process. Here's a map of where the residential schools were in Canada. Typically they were built <coughs> away from cities in remote areas, so they were quite isolated. Uh, the government couldn't afford to do this. This is a major you know, enterprise, social engineering enterprise or whatever. 
Uh, and so basically they, uh, they contracted with or agreed with the churches that the churches would do this. So most of these were run by religious orders. So they were staffed by people who were nuns and priests and uh, uh, people attached to religious orders. Uh, and there are lots of photographs of these things, which I think were taken by people who were proud of the orderliness and the neatness. But again, we look at them today with a, the eye of this is a total institution uh, for children who were not orphans, uh, who, were not, uh, who had families that wanted to be connected to them. Uh, but were taken at the age of five and put in these environments, and if they saw their family once a year, that was, uh, you know. Um, and these went on, as I say, for 100 years. The last uh, one, uh, I think, closed in 1980, uh, in the early 80s. The question is, are there studies about the mental health? And the answer is yes, there are some now, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe them briefly. But the first point to be made is that this history was largely unknown by most people until very recently. So it's an interesting also notion that in a large society, things can go on and systematic policies can go on and be enacted that are not part of collective awareness, really. So when I went to you know, elementary school here or whatever, this is not what we heard in terms of indigenous history. This was not mentioned at all, any of this. Um, when this became apparent was uh, when we had a, a, a crisis here, which I'll describe later, and then a royal commission of uh, Aboriginal peoples, and they collected testimony around the country, and this history came to light. And I think even for indigenous people in Canada, few were aware of the scale and the scope of this. They would know their own local history, but they wouldn't necessarily know that you know there were a hundred, hundred of these schools and that uh, you know hundred hundred and I forget what it is now I, I'm going to give you a wrong figure but it's something like one hundred and sixty thousand children or something like that I can't quite remember but it's an enormous number of kids. The other important point to make about the the numbers is that um, it was not just one child from a family or one family from a community it was whole cohorts of children so there were communities that essentially where most of the children disappeared from the community. And again, you can imagine what that does to the morale of a community, to the sense of identity, to the functioning of a community. And then those kids whose main experience of growing up and of social relations came from an institution. Institutions also, incidentally, where boys and girls were usually segregated, had little contact. Even if, you, even if your brother and sister, you had your older sister was there, you would not have contact with them. So you, you know, uh, then, after being there for 10 years, you go back to your community. And now you're supposed to be a member of your community, and now you can have children and bring them up. So the c concern is that people, not only in terms of the disruptions of attachment and normal development and sense of identity and all these other things that happened, uh, but also that there was this sabotage of the transmission of culture across generations. And then people who were becoming adults and parents whose model of child rearing and model of family life is being drawn from uh, you know, their school experience or their, or their fantasies, but not from an actual you know, ex useful experience that they could sort of draw from. I'm going to come back to this and about the impact of this transgeneration. I just want to mention a couple of other things about um, the impact. Uh, this is a, from a visit uh, to the uh, senior center in Iqaluit, uh, where the lady on the right was explaining to us another chapter in Inuit history in the 1950s. I just want to, because I'm just trying to give you a picture of all some of the different uh, ways in which the state interacted with indigenous people, I say always out of good intentions, or usually out of good intentions, but in ways that were really catastrophic for people's uh, well-being. So in the case of the Inuit, the problem is that traditionally Inuit had, uh, uh, did not have two names. Uh, they had a name that was, meant something within their family, but they were often unpronounceable by Europeans. So the government decided the way to keep track of Inuit was to give them all numbers. So in the 1950s, all Inuit were given numbers and referred to by their number. So needless to say, they don't find this uh, uh, a pleasant chapter in their history. So this lady is explaining this history to us and giving us all our Halunat numbers. The Inuit had E numbers for Eskimo numbers, and we got Halunat numbers, Q numbers. Halunat is in, in the word for the white people. For I think it means something like bushy eyebrows or whatever. But it's, uh, 
So these are our little, uh, with a, a picture of, a, I think, a hunter with a harpoon in his hand, and we all got our little thing. So I find this, uh, we're going to talk later about resilience, but I find this a, a nice expression of Inuit resilience, which is essentially talking about this rather chilling chapter in Inuit history, but with a sense of humor and a way to educate the rest of us kind of in this thing, which, as I say, again, we're not really part of common knowledge and uh, the sensibility, and you know, you don't have to have a, a or have or know somebody with a tattoo on their arm from a concentration camp to feel the sort of dehumanizing echoes of of being given a number instead of somebody trying to learn your name or or uh, you know work something else out with you. So that's the backdrop, that historical backdrop. The other, uh, some of the other things that happened in the 1960s, there was something called the 60s Scoop, particularly in the Midwest of Canada, where there was uh, the notion that because so many indigenous homes and communities were having problems with substance abuse and alcoholism and not able to provide a good environment for children, there was a high uh, uh, level of vigilance for problems in the family, and if there was a problem, the solution was let's take the child out of the family and let's find them a good white home. So there were large numbers of children who were taken from indigenous communities and given for adoption, or get foster homes or for adoption in white homes in other cities in other parts of the country, even in northeastern United States. So lots of kids went from uh, the Midwest and Canada to uh, northeast of the United States. So this has been also looked at as a kind of quasi-genocidal policy, again, because the effect, again, the, the intention is, oh, this is social welfare and child welfare. We're just trying to find good protection for children. But the effect, again, is to sabotage communities and uh, you know, the connections of families and so on. So taken together, all of these policies uh, have come to be viewed by many people as a sustained assault on their collective identity and on their communities. And it's been spoken about as a kind of cultural genocide you know, at this point, uh, and more broadly as a kind of process of historical trauma, that people have suffered so many forms of violence and loss over time that have been directed to them as a people, that that becomes the backdrop against which your individual problems, your individual story are always vis-a-vis -vis this uh, larger sustained uh, historical uh, uh, violence. I think the answer is yes to a degree, but not completely. There are other forces and other factors, which we'll talk about, that have to be understood. The reason being that the highest suicide rates are not in the people who went to residential schools. Um, they're in their children or their grandchildren. So yes, there can be a connection, and the connection part could partly be, as I said, the disruption of parenting, the, the wounds that were caused to the people who experienced the, the, these residential schools, so they have their own suffering and their own dilemmas, have their own uh, dilemmas in terms of finding a good model, and it's not just a model, because it's not just an actual thing, obviously. Being a parent is a lot of emotional learning, right, and responding to a crying child, let's say, which is emotionally challenging and which makes people feel burdened at times or irritated at times. How do you manage your own you know, frustration with your child. All of those things call out on a lot of resources. And if you have your own dilemmas around that, you're at risk for, you know, getting angry at your child or uh, deciding the only way I can deal with this is to go and have a drink or something. And all these things have impact. So that may play a role. And so this comes back to your point is then we're trying to trace a transgenerational transmission of phenomena in which how it affects each generation changes because the first generation is having, let's say, this direct assault on their identity. Then they're going back to the community trying to rebuild a life. So they have one particular complex set of issues that they're dealing with. The next generation is dealing with a parent who maybe has certain stories they don't want to tell because that's, in fact, what happened. So it's not necessarily that they're telling horrible stories. It's the certain silences. But certain, you know, this has uh, been talked about, again, in relation to transgenerational, transgenerational transmission of the Holocaust that so, in some cases they're visible transmission of things, but often it's not that. Often it's a preoccupied parent, or it's a parent, maybe the child hears the parent you know, crying in the night with nightmares or something, but then that doesn't get talked about. So these are very complex um, transmissions that are occurring now, not of exactly the same phenomenon. And that's one of the reasons why talking about transgenerational transmission is not always clarifying, because you have to sort of think, okay, but what's going on from generation to generation? It's a different process at each stage, because now somebody's has a new role, and they're having their own adaptation, and it's coming out in other ways. 
So for sure there's some connection, but just to anticipate, I think the missing ingredient is for young people, what's extraordinarily important is what's their future. You know, because you can deal with a lot of suffering, and this is like the refugee story again, you can deal with a lot of suffering if you know that you have a hopeful future, there's a good possibility. But if you feel, no, there are all kinds of structural barriers and limitations to where I can go, then the combination of a, a wounded past and an, uh, you know, a, a bleak future, that's very toxic. So I would say that the historical stuff is part of the story, it's, it's a crucial part, but it's not, it doesn't sufficiently by itself account for why young people, why males more than females, why et cetera, et cetera. And to get closer to that, we have to think more about what is the current situation for these young people and what is their what are their future options, their future strategies? And I say, we'll, we'll, we'll say more about that in the, in, this, in the second half. To actually show these transmissions is, is difficult, right? Uh, there are just a few studies now. Amy Bombay's uh, an Aboriginal uh, scholar is just finishing her, her doctorate at Carleton. And she did a study using an online sample. So it's not the ideal sample of people, but she asked people uh, about their families' exposure to residential schools and their own experience and so on, and she's able to show a clear correlation. Um, most of the evidence is anecdotal, uh, which is very clear in terms of people who had horrible experiences and, and so on down their family. There is a little bit of epidemiological data, and of course it's almost all retrospective at this point. So it's distorted by the fact, and we'll come to this at the end, that the story I'm telling you now has become widely known. It's become so widely known that this is now the way you narrate your suffering, and that makes the research hard to do. Because if everybody's going to, everybody's going to attribute all their problems to the bad things that happened in the past, uh, you know, where it, the causality becomes very hard to sort out at that point, if, if you're looking at it from a strict point of view. So I, I think there's little doubt that these things have had a very serious impact, but just how that transmission from generation to generation works, I think is very interesting. We need to understand it better. And I have a diagram, and we'll come back, I have a diagram that sort of shows that, and we'll talk a bit about, more about that. But I think we better take a, a good 10, so we, I have 22, let's take a 10 minute break, we'll come back at 10-2, and we'll uh, do the second half of this. So.